Thank you, Paul. Dean Solomon, Enrica, Kavitha, Shannon, nice job. Thank you all for being here. I need to paint you a picture. It's April 2018, and you're at the Collegiate National Championships representing the University of Michigan at Champaign, Illinois, for boxing. You've, you've spent some time, you've, you've had a fight, and in this situation, there's, it really comes down to you, you get one fight. If you win, you move on. If you lose, you're done. The team that ends up the weekend with the, ends with the most wins wins the national championship, and if you win your weight class, then you go home with a belt. So uh, here I am walking into the uh, ring, and I notice that uh, my opponent is quite a bit taller than I am. While I might have dashing good looks, I am certainly not going to kill anybody with my height. If I'm going to beat this guy, I've got to get on, got to get on the inside. Ding! Round one. It's a pretty rough first round. I take some hits. He's a lot taller than I am, and I struggle really to get inside. At one point, the referee has to pull us apart and tell me that I'm taking too many shots to the head. The object is to not take that many shots to the head. So as we move through the round, it's pretty, it, it, it's pretty rough, and towards the end of it, I survive. <laughs> Ding! We move out, I go back to my corner, and there's Coach Boz. He's a 6'3 national champion who oozes exuberance for anything boxing. He looks at me and tells me I did a nice job. I mean, what's he really going to say? Jesus, Steve, come on. <laughs> and I sit down in the corner, and I, and I just kind of hang my head. He says, how do you feel? And I just give him a big sigh. He's like, well, you've got to keep moving your head. Okay, folks, it doesn't take the level of intelligence of Aristotle to tell someone they've got to keep moving their head when they're getting pummeled. So, anyways, I look at, listen to Coach Boz, stand back up, and ding, we move on to round two. It's a little closer. I get a little bit on the inside. My opponent's starting to get tired, but he's still, he's, he's got the reach, and he's, he's pushing me around. But at this point, the referee doesn't have to tell me I'm taking too many shots to the head. Hey, we're making some improvement. This is good. <laughs> and uh, as we move through the round, I know that it's going to be a good fight, and I might have a chance. Ding. I go back to my corner, and Coach Boz is looking at me. He gives me some water. I really don't remember too much. The, ad the adrenaline was pumping, and... At that point, he looks at me, but I do remember him saying, now's your chance, he's tired, straight punches, go. Ding. Everything sort of comes together here. For a little while, my opponent, the tall guy with the long reach, he was tired. So I got, in, I got inside on him, and I hit him. I hit him a lot. And at one point, the referee had to pull us apart and told him he was getting head, hit in the head too much. This is good. The, I really fought my tail off in that last round. If amateur boxing had gone four, five rounds, I think I would have won the fight. But that, as it was, and as it is, it's only three rounds. The story doesn't have a Hollywood ending, but hey, Rocky didn't win his first fight either, so it's okay. And... I remember thinking as I, as I, as I moved to the round, it was, it was a good fight, and I felt good about myself. He won, a, he won in a decision. He won the first two rounds. I won the last round. As I was walking out of the ring that day, I remember thinking to myself, at some point, I had to make a decision. It wasn't going to go this way. I wasn't going to be pushed around. I didn't leave the service, drive across the country, spend a year in graduate school, and end up in Champaign, Illinois, just to have somebody else dictate the tempo to me. I knew that I'd have an opportunity to put the work in if I waited, stayed focused, didn't get distracted, and took advantage of the opportunity when it came to me. So how does all this parlay into a King talk? How does this relate to Dr. Martin Luther King? How does it relate to Unravel? And how am I going to cram all this in in the next few minutes? <laughs> Well, if you, how many of you have ever been to the MLK Memorial in Washington, D.C.? If you haven't, that's it right there. And like any good monument, there's some symbolism that you can see right off the bat. But there's also some symbolism that you have to take a step back and really take a minute to soak in. If you look at that monument, it's not finished. And that's by design. When Dr. King left us, his work wasn't finished. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a bus. 
In January, the following year, Martin Luther King was asked to lead the Montgomery Improvement Association. On January 30th, he was speaking to a mass congregation of the First Baptist Church when his house was bombed. He looked at his congregation, he told them what happened, and he left. When he arrived home, he noticed a few things. His home was surrounded by angry supporters, the police were there, and so was the press. He made his way through, he went inside, and he checked on Coretta and his brand new little baby, and once he found out that they were okay, he noticed something. The press, who needed to go file their stories, was trying to leave, but his supporters, who were noticeably angry, wouldn't let them out of the house. At that moment, King recognized something. He stood up, he went outside, and you, you can only imagine the tension that must have been felt in that place. It's something that you and I can hopefully never have to be in, but we'll have to really make an attempt to imagine. And he went outside, and he said, I'm okay. My family's okay. If you've come here with weapons, go home. I'm not advocating violence. I'm advocating open hearts and open minds. The situation was diffused. King knew in that moment, it was a pivotal moment, that his movement, which wasn't his movement, and he knew that, but people thought it was his movement, that the movement could have been lost or could have kept going with the decisions he made in that moment. He rose above, and by doing so, he allowed the movement to gather steam, even in that moment, so that it could persist without him. So, what, what does this show us? What can we take from this? How does it tie in to myself in boxing? In that moment in the ring, I had to make a decision. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fury, a little bit of chaos, and I needed to make a decision to rise above the moment and wait for the opportunity. In King's situation, he had, to, he had to know that there was a future beyond what was there now, and advocating for violence was exactly what his opponents wanted. You might, you might have dreams, you might have desires, you might have ambitions, you might be working hard for something but it seems like the world is pushing against you. Maybe you're trying to make the rent, maybe you're taking care of a sick loved one. There are situations right now where people are facing discrimination of all kinds, racism, sexism. You might even be thinking that you want to change the world, but the world's going in the opposite direction. So what can you do? You have to stay focused and rise above. You have to unravel from the chaos, whether you're getting punched in the head a bunch of times or if something more serious is happening. You have to rise above in that moment and make a decision to focus on your work. We, when we make that decision to focus on our work, when we decide this is what we're going to do, the unique situation is that we're liberated. We're free to lead. We're free to guide. We're free to do the work that we want to do. We're free to help others. All we have to do is make a decision. Whether you're working to change the world, or working on yourself to change the world tomorrow, or whether you're just looking to help someone. The idea is to focus on what it is and rise above the chaos. By doing so, you allow yourself the chance to work on your movement, to work in the middle, to work through the middle, to work through the obstacle. What is the work that you want to do? Who are the people that you want to connect to? What is your unfinished monument? Thank you.